Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This took place in West Virginia, where my grandma on my dad's side lived in a holler. My family and I live in Ohio, but would visit her off and on through the years. We always looked forward to it with excitement. It was like an adventure every time. My grandma always told a story to the family of a time when she saw a face in the window of a large hairy man she referred to as Burper. Her house sat up on a hill and her window was easily eight feet off the ground. So we all laughed it off and said, sure, grandma, thinking she was trying to entertain us because she often told stories. She told them pretty unbelievable stories and usually ones my mom would have rather my sister and I didn't hear. So we just chalked Burper up to another one of grandma's special stories. Years later, when I was an older teen, I went down to visit my grandma by myself after I struggled up the hill with all my bags to her house and got settled in. I noticed it had gotten really late and grandma seemed nervous. She was not normally a nervous woman by any means, so that got my attention. After some coaxing, she told me that she had been hearing noises in the woods late at night and she didn't want me going out there alone. I told her it was probably just animals in the woods and to try not to worry. She said that if I ever needed to go out at night to use the outhouse to wake her so she could go with me and we would take the big heavy silver flashlight she kept by the door. I knew I was going to have to go out at night at some point because the only other option to not using the outhouse was using the bucket that grandma kept for night emergencies and I really didn't like using it because, as you can imagine, it didn't smell the best. But I could see that she was serious, so I said I wouldn't go without her. About a week passed, and I forgot my talk with Grandma, mostly because I was having too much fun riding quads up and down the holler with the neighbors and wading in the creek. One night later that week, I was tossing and turning because it was a hot summer night and grandma didn't have air conditioning, and as I tried to get back to sleep, I realized that I needed to use the bathroom, and the bucket was in grandma's room, and I didn't want to wake her. After putting on my shoes, I got the flashlight and shut the door softly and made my way to the outhouse. It was well after two in the morning and dark and creepy with the woods beside the outhouse path. Shining the light around me, I started to relax, when I heard a twig snap behind me. Stopping on the path, I shined the light behind me and looked along the woods, but there was nothing there. Hearing noises in the woods started to make me nervous because up until that point, I had been using the bucket at night. I shone the light around the trees once more, then continued on my way until I got to the outhouse door. Sighing in relief when I went in and did my business, not even latching the door. I had to go so bad. Trying to hold my breath from the unpleasant smell all outhouses have, I heard what sounded like somebody slapping the side of the outhouse wall so hard that it shook. I froze in fear for a moment, then quickly locked the door and held onto the door handle as if my life depended on it, which in that moment I thought it might. Another slap shook the wall as I clutched the handle tighter, screaming at the top of my lungs. I clung onto the door handle more terrified than I'd ever been in my life. Sobbing hysterically, I heard another slap, this time at the top of the door where the screen was, and right as I looked up, a big hairy arm tore through. Grabbing the heavy flashlight, I hit the arm over and over as hard as I could, screaming as loud as I could. Hearing a howl of pain, I heard heavy breathing as the thing must have run back into the woods. Sitting on the floor by the door, I wrapped my shirt sleeve through the handle and held on to it all night, holding the flashlight in my other arm. It must have stayed like that for hours, 
because the next morning I felt somebody trying to open the door and my name being called frantically. Realizing it was my grandmother, I opened the door and she kneeled, hugging me while I cried. I'll never forget that comforting hug for the rest of my life. My grandma is no longer with us, but she was the kind of person you never forget, and I know her story about Burper were most likely all too true. On to the next one. I grew up in Lance, Michigan. It's a small village with a current population of just over 2,000. There's not a whole lot of options for entertainment in that place, especially in the winter. And let me tell you, that winter feels like it lasts a lifetime. I lived with my grandparents, who I love dearly, and my grandpa had me working with him on crafts ever since I can remember. The first thing I remember helping him put together was a sandbox. I must have been around the age of four when we constructed that thing, and I can't help but assume my assistance wasn't of much value. I don't remember the visitor showing up while my grandpa was there with me. The land was probably dirt cheap back then, and I'm not even sure how many acres we had to ourselves, but it was a lot. Because of that, they felt safe leaving me outside for brief periods during the summer months. I loved playing in that sandbox with my collection of plastic toy trucks. They resembled a fleet of construction vehicles, so they were perfect for a sandbox. My grandparents would pretend like they were giving me little jobs to do, mainly telling me the number of sandcastles they wanted. Those have always been some of my fondest memories, but things got creepy once the visitor came around. The first time I can recall seeing the entity, I thought there was a horse in our yard since the sandbox sat close to a section of wood. I could only see a portion of it at first glance. I had grown very accustomed to being around horses and other farm animals, so I can't remember a time that they were ever intimidating to me, but the fur color and size made me think I was looking at a horse, and it wasn't all that uncommon to hear stories about barnyard animals finding their way into a neighbor's yard or into a local street. But it wasn't long before I caught the sight of its face. For whatever reason, its lips were in the shape of an O, and they remained that way for a long time. It looked as though it was attempting to mimic an owl's hoot, but I don't remember it making any noise. I often wonder if its facial expression played a significant role in not making me scream when I first saw it. I bet it would have been a completely different story if it had displayed its teeth or growled at me. Something about it almost looked clownish. Since my grandparents often came outside to check on me, I probably assumed it was only a matter of time before one of them saw the entity for themselves. I think it's so interesting how my adolescent brain didn't perceive this thing to be a monster at first sight. And please bear in mind that I had no idea what a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot was at that age. Whatever had intruded onto our yard, I had no way of identifying it, and somehow that notion seemed to put me at ease. That same trend must have carried for at least three or four occasions over a couple of weeks before things got out of hand. I told my grandparents about it, but didn't know how to describe what was going on. I'm not sure about this, but I feel like I was telling them that an animal man was in the yard. I don't remember them getting worked up, so they probably assumed I imagined the whole thing. However, the mess would hit the fan soon enough. After a handful of occasions where I noticed this thing watching me, there came a day where the entity fully emerged from behind the trees. Something about how it hobbled toward me immediately made me feel far more uncomfortable than the previous sighting. I could be wrong, but it felt aggressive. It was like it decided it should snatch me while I was alone. But the entity stopped dead in its tracks when a gunshot echoed throughout the land. It was probably too frightened to turn around. However, my grandpa soon appeared in front of me, aiming his rifle at the entity. Without keeping its eyes off me, the entity began backpedaling, 
toward the conglomerate of trees. It came. Scram, my grandpa yelled, just before shooting a second shot right over the entity's head. This creature maintained that same strange facial expression even while it was getting shot at. Finally, right before it retched out of sight, the lips curved and it let out a loud hiss, making it very clear that it was not pleased by my grandpa's conduct. I thought something about the hiss reminded me of a house cat hiss only a hundred times louder. After it was evident that the entity was out of reach, I felt hands lifting me off the ground from behind. It startled me at first, but I quickly recognized my grandma's touch. My chin leaned on her shoulder as she rushed me back toward the house. And that was when I saw the entity lunge out of the woods and run straight for my grandpa. It nearly caused him to drop his rifle, but he got it together and shot at the entity twice more before it turned and ran off again. I remember feeling so overwhelmingly relieved when my grandpa walked through the side door a few moments later and it was noticeable that he was unharmed. I was never again allowed to play outside by myself and perhaps that prompted the mysterious entity to snoop around elsewhere. So many people claim to hear these creatures hooting and hollering when they're within the vicinity. They never heard anything like that, as far as I can remember. The entity seemed extremely intent on being stealthy, so it's somewhat tricky for me to imagine them frequently announcing their presence in other parts of the country. But I suppose they would have to find mates somehow, and that might be one of the only ways to get it done if the species is scarce. Neither he nor my grandma seemed to ever refer to it as an animal. For whatever reason, they didn't seem like they were all that interested in discussing it, but the few times I heard them talk about it, you would have thought they were talking about nothing more than a crazy man. Trust me when I tell you that this was no man. I may have been young, but my memory of that event is as sharp as ever. This entity was a furry, woodland, bipedal predator. There's just no question. I suppose I can understand why my grandparents would have tried to convince themselves otherwise. I often wish they were still alive so we could have discussed the whole thing. It would have been interesting to see if I could extract any new details regarding what happened on that strange day. I so often wonder what else might exist out there in the wild, especially since I've now been exposed to a wide range of other people's sightings and encounters. To the naysayers, consider how many of these reports are out there. Do you genuinely believe all of them are fabricated? Or is it more so that you want to shelter your mind from a frightening reality? On to the next one. I used to have a friend named Ryan, and we'd known each other since about third grade. We really didn't have much in common, to be honest, but we lived down the street from each other and were in the same grade, so we started walking home from school together and eventually became friends. Sort of a friendship of convenience, so to speak. We lived in Logan, Utah, which is in the lower slopes of the Bear River Mountains and the home of Utah State University. I was kind of quiet and I liked to read, and Ryan was loud and liked games and any kind of setting where he could make noise. Kind of like introverts and extroverts, I guess. Our friendship lasted until about high school, then it mostly ended. I got tired of Ryan's craziness and distanced myself from him. You see, Ryan was what one would call a prankster. He seemed to really enjoy pulling pranks on people, and there was something in his personality that got off on it. I used to think it was a power trip that he was pulling something over on you so that it made him feel powerful, but then I decided it was a superiority thing. Then later I found out he'd been teased and had lots of abuse from his older sisters and brother, so I decided it was a form of vengeance, though on innocent people since he couldn't take it out on the original perpetrators. Shoot, I'm no shrink, so maybe it was none of the above. Or maybe all the above? Who knows? I just know he was starting to go where I didn't want to go with his pranks, and I quit hanging with him. He knew why, too, because I told him. 
And I told him many times he was going way too far with things, but he never believed me. But something interesting happened later that cured Ryan of his pranks, and I think after that, Ryan maybe did believe me that pranks could lead to pain, whether mental or physical, and they weren't really a good thing to engage in. Ryan was playing jokes on people the day I met him. In fact, that's how I met him. He had just moved to the neighborhood and was walking home from school. He was dragging along like he could barely walk. And when he saw me, he introduced himself and asked if I would help him get home as he was having trouble. I asked him what was wrong and he'd said he hadn't been out of surgery very long and had a lung removed because of some infection. Could I help him? He was pleading and of course, who wouldn't help? I carried his books and let him kind of lean against me until we got to his house. Then he said thanks and went inside. Next day, he was fine and seemed to have forgotten all about having had a lung removed when we were all playing soccer. I asked him how he was doing and he acted like he didn't know what I was talking about. Then when he remembered, he said he'd had a miraculous recovery. I think he was a pathological liar on top of being a prankster and the two kind of went together. Anyway, he was always pulling stunts like that. One time, he talked me into helping him drag some old straw bales down to an irrigation canal where we cut off the string and set the bales on fire. They went merrily floating down the canal all ablaze, ending up coming aground at some old guy's yard and setting his weeds on fire. The fire department came and put it out and nobody ever knew what had started it, except me and Ryan, that is. Another time, we spent all day collecting tumbleweeds from a nearby field and stacking them in an empty lot at the edge of town. That pile was a good 20 feet high. When the wind came up, those weeds blew all over town, which we thought was pretty funny. Well, when a kid's in grade school, you can see pulling a few pranks and such, as it's just part of what makes kids kids, especially boys. But when they get older, you expect them to outgrow it. The ones that don't sometimes end up in jail. Ryan's pranks were pretty harmless, except for a couple like the straw bale incident. Most of his pranks would typically serve to embarrass someone, and it was never Ryan who was embarrassed, guaranteed. And when Ryan got into middle school, instead of outgrowing it, he just got worse. For example, there was the time he talked some younger kid into helping him steal some chicken. That in itself was bad enough, but the purpose of stealing the chickens was to put them in the school principal's office, where they ended up pretty much destroying the place. I think he got that one from reading about some senior class pranks. Ryan had pried the window open and tossed these poor birds in there, and they weren't found until the next day. He never got caught, but I found out about it later and I really wanted to turn him in, but couldn't do it as we were supposed to be friends. But I thought it was a pretty crappy thing to do and told him so. That was one incident that made me question our friendship. Ryan wasn't dishonest overall, though he could tell lies with the best of them. But he never cheated on tests or anything like that. He seemed to have his own set of standards and they always revolved around pranking other people. If it were necessary for a good prank, sure, he would lie and steal, but if not, he was as honest and trustworthy as they came. I often wondered if he could see the cognitive dissonance in his own action. Did he ever get caught? Sure, but what do you do? I think he may have been in a couple of fights a time or two, but nothing very serious, and it sure didn't slow him down. He usually didn't do anything illegal, except for the chickens and the straw bales, so nobody with authority was ever after him, and he was amazingly good at talking you out of being mad. He did get suspended once for three days in middle school for disassembling the teacher's desk, the one she always pounded on when yelling at students to quiet down, which then went flying all over the room the next time she pounded on it. That was one of the few pranks where he actually had an appreciative audience. And he was also kicked out of the Boy Scouts for duct taping the zippers of everyone's tents closed with them inside sleeping, which he claimed he didn't do. 
that was the one thing that really bummed him out because I think he really liked Boy Scout and wanted to stay in it. By then, Ryan had earned himself a reputation. So, he naturally got blamed since his tent was the only one not taped shut. He said it was a setup to make him look guilty. He was guilty, if not of that prank, of plenty others. Well, fast forward to high school. In spite of his usual stuff of setting classroom clocks forward 10 minutes and nonsense like that, he did pretty good at staying out of trouble. Until he found out the Boy Scouts were having a big camp out in nearby Spring Hollow Campground, where he ended up getting himself into a situation that ended his pranking for good. A situation he never forgot. Now Boy Scout is really big in Utah. There are lots of scout troops as the main church there has really embraced the program. And there's always something going on in the scouting world. You can easily spot Utah Boy Scout as they always have spring bar tents which are made in Salt Lake City. Some of those tents have been in the scout business longer than the scout leaders, 40 years or more. Well, one day I got a call from Ryan asking me to come over to his house to see something he'd built, as he wanted my opinion. At this point, we weren't talking much and I felt kind of guilty, I guess. So I went on over there, half expecting to be pranked. He took me down to his basement where he had something big hidden under a sheet, something that was about six feet tall and four feet wide. He pulled the sheet off and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a life-sized Bigfoot, or at least how I would picture a life-sized Bigfoot would look, as I'd never actually seen one. I examined it and he'd made it out of stiff cardboard on a light wood frame, then painted it. It looked pretty real, with long dark hair and red eyes and a snarl and teeth that would scare one to death if he saw it at night. I asked him what it was for, and he said he was going to make a Bigfoot movie. I was impressed and said so. Ryan then took out his iPod and out of it came the scariest howling sound I've ever heard. What the heck is that, I asked. Bigfoot sound from the internet. It goes with the movie. I'm going to put it on my boombox so I can blast it out in the woods. We talked a little about his movie. Then Ryan, being who he was, asked me to help him get the Bigfoot out of his basement. Of course, he had neglected to tell me that it was his main purpose for asking me over, but I didn't mind and we angled the thing out and took it out to his garage. It wasn't heavy, just bulky. I thought the movie would be fun, but I really didn't want to get involved, so I wished him luck and went home. Of course, he may have been planning on making a movie, but he was also planning on using it for something else, which he neglected to mention. Good old Ryan. Well, Spring Hollow Campground is about four miles up Logan Canyon from town and a really nice place to camp with a wetland nearby with lots of cattails, willows, and birds. The local scout troop would be camping there for the weekend over in one of the group sites. I think Ryan still held a grudge against the scout leader who'd given him the boot and that scout leader would be there with his troop. I found all this out later, of course, Apparently, Ryan was able to carry this Bigfoot guy on his back. Having rigged a sling, he then managed to get it onto his dirt bike and rode it up the canyon real slow. And I guess a couple of times, the thing almost took off with him, like a big sail. He did this at night, of course, and took it up behind where the scouts were camping into the trees and set it up, making sure it was in their line of sight through the thick trees. He then got his boombox and set it next to the Bigfoot. He then bided his time, sitting there in the dark, watching the festivities around a big bonfire. This is one time I kind of felt sorry for Ryan. When I heard about it later, as I knew, he felt like he'd been cheated out of being in the Boy Scout. The tent incident had made him feel the pain of being pranked, which was ironic, as it was the very same thing he'd done numerous times to others. So, he sat there, and when it started getting late and the kids were winding down a bit, he picked up a big piece of wood and started knocking on a tree with it. Wham, 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 three times. Then he stopped. It took a while before he got any kind of response, but soon it quieted down around the fire. 
He did it again, and soon one of the kids was answering him back, knocking on a tree by camp. The plan was for him to get their attention, and then they would shine their light into the trees and see the Bigfoot, and be terrified. He would hide in the bushes and enjoy it all while blasting out the howling on his boombox. But so far, nobody seemed very scared. They acted like they enjoyed the idea of a Bigfoot being out there. There were now several of them tree knocking. He started whacking on the tree again, and the kids answered. This went on several times. But one time, when Ryan stopped, he swore he could hear knocking in the woods up the steep canyon way behind him. Logan Canyon cut through the rugged mountains with lots of big rocks and thick stands of timber. Ryan at first thought someone up in the canyon was mimicking his wood knocking, so he just continued on with his prank. The kids below were now getting more worked up, which is exactly what he wanted. Now it was time for the recording. Hopefully someone would shine a light over to where the Bigfoot was and they would all freak out. He placed it not too far from camp, but not close enough that anyone would have the nerve to go see what it was up close. He cranked up the sound recording, which had a really powerful bass. Now he was having fun. As the kids were yelling and some were running and getting into the scout vehicle, the scout leader was now walking around looking distressed and trying to calm the kids down. Ryan was rolling over, laughing hard. He could hear just enough to make out bits and parts of the conversation. One of the kids was yelling, We gotta get out of here, over and over, scared to death. Sure enough, someone pointed a big flashlight in the direction of the sound and apparently saw Ryan's Bigfoot, because this started a whole new round of yelling and screaming. Ryan's prank was working, and he was about to pee himself he was having so much fun. But suddenly... He could hear a thumping behind him, and it was so loud it made the ground shake. Ryan suddenly felt the hair on his neck stand up and his stomach began to feel queasy from a stench that came from the thick oak and maple wood behind him. He turned around just in time to see a large tree come hurtling toward him, barely missing his head and crashing into the Bigfoot cutout. Then he saw what had thrown the tree, and he started screaming, which of course added to the fears below, but which wasn't supposed to be part of the prank. Even though it was dark, Ryan got a close-up look at a real Bigfoot, and he described it as being around 7 to 8 feet tall and weighing about 600 pounds. What he could see of its face was like an ape, though longer and with no hair on the eyes nor the cheeks, where its skin was chocolate-colored. It had a very prominent brow, and dark eyes that seemed to glow. Ryan turned and ran toward the camp, still screaming. As he came bounding through the brush and rock, he tripped and fell, then got up again, just as a rock came hurtling behind him, barely missing him. As Ryan came screaming into the camp, the scout crammed close to the fire for safety, while the leader shone a flashlight Ryan's way, which of course made it harder for him to see where he was going. But, he finally made it into the fire circle where he collapsed sobbing. Now the Bigfoot let out a howl like nothing any of them had ever heard and sounds of shattering wood filled the forest. A tree came flying their way, a big one, freshly wretched from the ground, but it didn't quite make it to the fire circle. At this point, the scoutmaster decided it would be prudent to get everyone into the van and out of there. So he did, including Ryan, and left the campground, spring bar tents and gear and the fire burning. They were soon back in Logan, where he dropped Ryan off at his house, then took all the kids home. The next day, Ryan's mom took him back for his dirt bike. He hadn't said a word about his hope, and instead had made up a story about not wanting to ride it back down to town in the dark. The scouts eventually retrieved their gear, and that was the end of that camping trip, though it wasn't the end of the talk about Bigfoot. After I heard about all this from Ryan, he talked me into going back up there to get his little portable boombox. I reluctantly did, and we climbed up into the trees above the campground, where we found it right where he left it. Not far away was the Bigfoot cutout, torn to shreds. We didn't stay long, 
and I noticed that Ryan was very subdued. Not long after that, he was invited to a scout meeting to relate his story to the scouts, which, of course, was quite different from what had actually happened. He told me later that he'd been invited to be a scout assistant. Since this was the same leader who had kicked him out, Ryan was very honored and jumped at the chance. He became kind of a hero to everyone, in spite of his blubbering and screaming that night. I would suspect he made a good leader and came up with some very creative things for them to do, and I know he didn't allow any pranks. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening, and on to the next one. For those of you who hadn't seen it before, the Longstone Caldera was truly a wonder to behold, tucked between some of southern Colorado's rocky 10,000-plus foot peaks. The caldera was an 11-mile wide expanse of tall bunch grass dotted with only a few streams and trees, stretched out to the distant forest on all sides. From any angle, including from the sky, it looked like the world's largest, highest mountain meadow. Despite the lush, green beauty on the surface, the true marvel of this landscape was underneath. The caldera actually was the very top of a massive volcano more than a million years old, identifiable now only by the enormous, rolling, virtually treeless meadow atop it. In the fading sunlight of a cool late summer Colorado evening, several cars had driven through a large, recently opened wooden gate at the end of the caldera property off the highway. One by one, the cars proceeded down a long gravel road and eventually parked in front of a ranger station located well out into the vast meadow. Two white passenger vans bearing Longstone Wildlife Tours decals were already parked next to the station. Located on land that had been purchased from a group of private landowners by the federal government, the caldera was a natural public preserve managed by forest rangers. The park rangers offered diverse educational programs for the public, including lectures, guided hikes, and van tours at different times of the year, depending on the nature topic addressed. Typical ranger-directed van tours on the Longstone schedule included views of elk. The caldera had a substantial elk population. Coyotes, badgers, bobcats, black bears, golden eagles, prairie dogs, and wandering cattle herds. However, tonight's van tour was not going to be the typical tour. The species thought tonight was none other than Bigfoot or Sasquatch as otherwise known. Longstone Wildlife Tours had scheduled this one-time excursion somewhat as a reaction to recent Bigfoot sightings in the area and as a special offering for those few people interested in these unusual animal accounts. The rather serious tour crowd, typically on site, would be replaced tonight with those whose viewpoints veered more toward the unexplained aspects of nature. Dottie and Norm, a couple who had retired from national laboratory jobs some years before, were still quite active, 
had driven up from northern New Mexico to participate. They were both Bigfoot enthusiasts. Norm, whose speaking voice retained a bit of long-ago-acquired Texas twang. His outdoor adventures with an accompanying flask of onboard liquor to keep the excursion interesting. Fred and Lynn were a middle-aged pair from Trinidad, Colorado, who were studious but fun-loving. Fred was a tall, slightly gawky thin man with glasses, and Lynn was a lovely, red-haired, shapely woman. The Chavez family was a local foursome, two late 30-something parents and a preteen son and daughter. From up north a bit, in Castle Rock, Jane and Laura Lee were a young female couple who took every conceivable outdoor challenge, particularly in the area of cryptozoology. A spooky nighttime monster quest was right up their alley. All of these small family groups were standing in a circle around tour leaders Martin and Dave of the Park Service. The rangers had given an introductory talk on the subject of Bigfoot. Given the uniqueness of the topic, everyone was paying rapt attention to the rangers except for young Tony Chavez, who was rather glued to his smartphone chatting with friends elsewhere. Ranger Dave led the group to the back of his personal SUV, where he had some plaster footprint track cast copies arrayed on the tailgate. He explained the origins of each of the casts, particularly the locations in the U.S. or Canada where each track cast was originally made. The creature in question was clearly called Bigfoot for a reason. Anyone who picked up one of the heavy plaster casts was instantly amazed at the size. Some were over 18 inches long. One cast was nearly 22 inches in length. Upon walking up to the back of the SUV and closely observing a cast, Norm said, I don't think I want to meet one of those fellas unprepared. Dave quickly explained, meetings with the big guys are pretty hard to come by, but whenever you go out into the remote wilderness, it's important to be as prepared as possible. Norm apparently thought about that statement for a moment, then said, Fortunately, I go prepared pretty much everywhere, patting the upper pocket of his light jacket to indicate his little liquor stash. Dave didn't quite know what to make of the reference, so he just smiled in a friendly ranger manner. You need to keep an eye out for bears and mountain lions, or cougars mostly, piped up Tony's younger sister, Desiree, who had black hair pulled back in pigtails. It's best to stay in a group and make some noise. She clearly wasn't an amateur in the ways of the forest. That's right, said Martin. Good job, young lady. Soon, Martin began leading the group in a discussion about what they'd likely do that night out on the tour. We'll drive up toward San Antonio Peak, where there were some sightings about four months ago, said Martin. A dark-haired, bearded young man wearing camo khakis, hiking boots, a ball cap and glasses. He continued, Along the way, you'll probably get to see some nice groupings of elk at dusk in the Petite Valley area. Then we'll head deeper into the Carson Forest and see if we can scare something that's bigger. Scare something up? asked Laura Lee quickly. What exactly do you mean? Martin chuckled just a bit and said, We'll do some of the typical Sasquatch calling techniques, like stick and rock clacking, plus we'll make some whoops. Whoops, maybe I came on the wrong tour, interjected Norm Riley. He burped quietly after making the statement. The group laughed at Norm's pun. Martin continued with the tour's instructions. You're welcome to bring your phones and cameras to try to get some photos of the traditional wildlife here on the way up, he said. But. When we're well back within Carson, it'll be entirely dark and you won't see more than the tip of your nose, most likely. Maybe Rudolph can accompany us, said Norm, in a sprightly manner. His reindeer reference generated a couple of short laughs, though not from his wife Dottie. And maybe you can lay off with the unneeded editorial comment Dottie said to her husband in a low but forceful voice. Uh, okay then, folks, mumbled Dave at an attempt to regain some focus on the evening's tour topic. Let's load up and do some squatching. 
will be taking the van on the right, he added. As most in the group walked toward the tour van, a few people jogged back to their cars to pick up some of their small equipment, snacks, or bottled water. Soon, everyone had gotten into the idling tour van. Marvin was at the wheel, and Dave, a fair-skinned, ruddy-faced young man wearing a long stone hat and a light jacket, was in the front passenger seat. Right behind them sat the Chavez family. Tony was still looking at his phone, but his sister Desiree clearly wanted to engage the rangers in discussion as the van started toward the distant tree line along a straight dirt road. How many elk are up here at this time of year? She asked toward the front seat. Dave, the primary Bigfoot enthusiast up front, deferred to Martin's substantial experience with the local fauna. Well, we're not exactly sure, but the number is at least in the hundred, answered Martin loudly over the hum of the van engine as the vehicle bounced over the rough road. The group continued to chat, with passengers needing to speak in loud voices in order to lob any questions to the rangers over the din of the engine. Topics ranged from historical Sasquatch sightings in the area to theories about the origins of the creature and its current population numbers, and even to rangers' personal experiences with the creature. When Lynn asked whether the young man had ever seen one, there was no response for a moment. Then Dave spoke up. I was hiking by myself up here a few years ago with just a camera and a backpack, began Dave. When I stopped to take a late afternoon rest at a tree line next to a wide ravine, I sat down to relax and get a snack with my bag against a big tree. Looking across the ravine, after a few minutes, I realized that a large dark shape behind some brush far out on the other side of the ravine was moving just a little. I held completely still and quiet for a while, and soon this massive dark gray thing stood up to its full height. Dave said loudly as every other passenger listened in full attention. It had to be at least seven and a half feet tall when upright, said Dave. It didn't have much of a neck, and it had hugely broad shoulders that made it look like a monstrous, hairy football player on steroids. It was so big, said Dave. Desiree Chavez and her dad Henry laughed at this fitting description. The thing stood there for a minute or two, just staring right at me, resumed Dave. Then it turned quickly and disappeared straight back into the trees. I heard it march off with very heavy footfalls, and leaf crunching as it blasted through the forest on the other side. My heart was pounding like a crazy drum, and I tried to think of what to do. But of course, the creature was very quickly out of view, and there was a big dry river chasm between us, and to top it all off, I hadn't even thought to reach for my camera. I'll tell you what, though. It quickly changed my life, Dave added. I've pretty much been looking for it ever since, he concluded. Wow, said Fred and Lynn, simultaneously as they pondered the power of the experience and the after effect it clearly had on Dave. Why didn't you shoot it? Tony Chavez virtually yelled out, barely without looking up from his phone. Dave let the non-graceful query settle over himself, Martin, and all the passengers. First of all, I was unarmed out there, Dave said. Tony goffed slightly. Second, there's no reason at all to shoot one of these animals. They're intelligent, they're quite aware, and very nearly human, Dave gracefully explained to Tony, and, by extension, all of the other people. Uh, everybody knows these things aren't real, began Tony again, so maybe next time, blast the thing. Tony, said Henry Chavez, disapprovingly to his son, everyone else in the van, initiated some sort of redirected behavior in order to mask their discomfort at the exchange, such as shuffling their feet or repositioning their bodies for a better view out the van windows. Just then, Dave auspiciously assumed the tour guide mantle again, saying, look there, on the hillside to your left, there's a herd of about 30 elk grazing. Passengers on the left of the van scrunched up to the windows, while the few passengers on the right rose somewhat from their seats and leaned leftward to get a better look at the large feeding quadrupeds. In front of a line of large dark trees, 
big brown creatures of all different sizes were grouped close together with their heads down on the ground, enjoying their late evening snack. Elk feed mostly in the morning and evening hours, offered Desiree in a didactic, professorial manner to the rest of the tour participants. That's right, agreed Martin. Who cares, said Tony to his sister sitting next to him. You're a moron, you know that, she said to Tony. Hey, you two, admonished Ginny Chavez, looking sternly at her children in the seat behind her. Knock it off. Upon seeing the elk, Martin had slowed the van to a near stop. But now, with folks having enjoyed spotting some indigenous creatures, the van continued onward at a speed across the increasingly tree-lined natural thoroughfare. The van entered an area with some large trees at one point, and the unimproved road got very rocky. But soon, they were back out in an open meadow area. It was almost dark now. A nearly full moon was coming up prominently in the deep blue but darkening sky of the east. As the van bumped roughly along the meadow road toward the next line of trees, there was some large object visible several hundred feet in front of the vehicle. Fred said to the group, Hey, look, there's something big and dark up ahead. Everyone in the van, including Rangers Dave and Martin, leaned forward and strained their eyes to see what might be in the dirt road up ahead. Martin slowed the van to a crawl as they approached what seemed like a very large black creature near an open gate on the road. The palpable presence of the Bigfoot legend added some weight and a tinge of fear to the sighting. Um, it's two cows, said Martin bluntly. Might be a mama and her calf, he added, since one cow was quite large and the other not nearly as much. While speaking, Martin pulled the van right up to where the cows were standing in the road. The mom or elder just stood off to the edge of the road, while the smaller cow remained right in the middle, positioned toward and staring right at the van. Lynn said fairly gleefully, The little one doesn't want to move. Martin gently edged the van up toward the cow. At this, the mom cow made a little extra room by zipping further off the trail to the left, but the small cow simply turned around and headed straight down the road in the same direction of the van. A number of the van passengers laughed at being led by a little bovine. Looks like you want to show us where to go, suggested Dave. This generated group giggles. The van rolled slowly toward the next group of trees with the cow jogging right in front. Martin knew this cow-car pairing wasn't sustainable, but he literally rolled with it for now. That stupid thing, said Tony, as the van caught up to the small cow, which by now had drifted off the center of the road and was jogging adjacent to the road just before the tree line appeared. The still ambling cow peeled off to the left, issuing a youthful moo, and turned around to seek its elder companion. Life finds a way, said Martin, in a sing-song voice, echoing an old sci-fi monster movie. The passengers all settled fully back into their seat as the van entered the woods again. After a few minutes of driving deeper and deeper into the near darkness, the van slowed up and Martin spoke to the group. Now that it's about dark, he said, we're going to stop and do what investigators do when they want to make contact. Everyone in the van but Tony experienced a shiver after the statement of Martin. He added, Let's disembark and get to it. Everyone reached for the van door handles and stepped out into the darkness. Martin had stopped the van quite some distance along the mountain trail in an area lush with huge ponderosa pines, Engelman spruce, and Douglas fir trees. This was, in every way, the deep, dark forest, particularly at night. Now outside, the passengers attempted to shake off the percussion of more than 10 minutes worth of slow but bumpy vehicle travel. They stepped out of the van and settled largely in small family groups not far from the van. What every individual, including Martin and Dave, fully experienced was the utter blackness of their surroundings. Geez, look at all the stars, remarked Lynn with a whisper as she looked up into the sky above the canopy of huge trees. With the harsh human lights of cities, suburbs, and streets 
Having long since dropped away, the tour travelers got a rare look at a priceless plethora of unfiltered stars across the heavens. As each person looked skyward, Fred said, and man, how quiet it is. He was right. The lack of vehicle, plane, elk, and bovine sounds made this dark landscape feel positively otherworldly. It was an utterly quiet, slightly starlit oasis of blackness. Well, let's get started now. Dave soon said over the awe-inspired silence that had accumulated among the tour group. We'll go with some knocks, he said. At this point, none of the civilian guests had any particular idea of what to expect. They all heard a little rustling. Several moments later, three shocking twack noises erupted violently and echoed through the forest with startling power. To each guest, the sound resembled a 12-gauge shotgun or tank missile fired right at the fringe of their fragile earlobes. The sounds were clearly a wooden impact, but without expecting such a percussive blast, everyone nearly passed out with shock and surprise. After recovering from the shock somewhat, it occurred to Fred that Dave and Martin must have enjoyed delivering the first tree knocks to the assembled greenhorns, jostling them with a few booms out of their suburban comfort. My word, that was loud, remarked Jane as she clung slightly to Laura Lee's arm. Sorry, began Dave, but we believe that one way these creatures communicate is through tree knocks, so we try to talk with them when we can. And we don't hold back much, given the vast distances out here, he added. Martin then said, you guys try it now. Everyone looked around themselves, but quickly realized it was too dark to see the tour guides, the van, or virtually anything else. This way, Dave instructed, and a couple of the guests walked cautiously toward his voice, trying not to trip and fall. <clears throat> After Fred bumped into him in the dark, Dave handed the two boards to Fred, who knocked them together, albeit much more mildly than had Dave. Not much of a knock, I guess, Fred said. I'll try again. He took more robust swings this time, issuing two loud wooden blasts out into the night air. The group stood still, listening to the sound echoing through the deep forest. There was no other subsequent sound. The silence seemed nearly deafening. A couple of other guests soon took turns making some feeble to medium volume knocks. Then Dave said, Okay, I think it's time for some other sound. Off the side of the road, Dave had found and picked up two rocks roughly the size of softballs, and he slammed them together with a resounding clack. Like the knock before, the clacks echoed through the trees, and everyone listened with focus. Dave did a couple more clacks with no response, but then decided on a transition. Okay, let's do some vocalizations, he said. No one knew what to expect at this point. Dave put his right hand up to the side of his mouth, then let out an extended cry of whoop that started at middle pitch and went up high into the falsetto range. Oh, said Jane with surprise as the strange sound rang out through the trees. Seconds later, Martin issued a noise as well. It was more of a warning siren type yell that started out in a medium range of pitch, then descended to a stop after several long seconds. Oh, it seemed to cry at length. Again, the entire group stood still and listened with senses taut. After about ten seconds, two powerful tree knocks issued from the distance. This clearly wasn't an elk or a spunky little cow. Did you hear that? Asked Dave excitedly. That was a response. Believers, skeptics, and park rangers alike all felt some level of fright as it was clear that, far out here, in the middle of nowhere, in the deep blackness of night, another large creature was taking notice of them. There was some hubbub of slight movement and murmuring among the participants as they literally rubbed shoulders with each other after the unexpected tree knock response. Dave once again had the sound boards in hand and, he generated two knocks similar to what the group had just heard from the distance. More silence ensued. The gap in sound was 20 seconds or so, then 
the group heard a low, very forceful huff sound in a voice that seemed much closer than the prior knock. It carried a deep resonance that put a tremor into each of the humans standing rather helplessly in the dark. Oh, God, said Laurelly without hesitation, though quietly. Now the group could hear some very powerful bipedal-type footfalls coming through the forest and down a nearby ridge toward them. What do we do now? asked Norm with a barely controlled whisper. Just stay together and be quiet, answered Martin. He really didn't have any other intelligent instructions to offer since this situation was clearly well outside the perimeters of their typical tours in the trees. Norm urgently asked, Isn't anybody packing? He received just a couple of feeble no responses from the downcast group. There were no firearms at hand to facilitate protection. Everyone in the group huddled much closer together now, forming the forest equivalent of a football huddle 20 feet or so away from the tour van. Tree limbs were breaking as the large forest individual came much closer down the hill now. Just then, most of the tour group caught wind of a deeply offensive odor resembling rotten trash and foul sweat. Trouble had truly arrived. The large individual seemed to take a few noisy sliding steps down the little dirt hill adjacent to the road. To the utter shock and dread of the human group, the visitor landed with a gigantic thud as all of the weight came down on the road at once. To those standing close by, the sound was on par with an uncomfortably localized earthquake. A few pitiful, frightened squeaks could be heard among the group. No one dared say a word. The only visible light now was from the moonlight, which had risen in the distance of the road where the tour group had come into the woods. So now, the huddled group got the terrifying sight of a lifetime. Looking toward the van with some moonlight, high above in the background, they could see a deeply oversized human-looking figure standing between them and the vehicle. The black figure absolutely towered over the van, rendering little of the van visible to the guests. A feeling of complete vulnerability overcame each person to the point where some nearly lost consciousness. Being in deep darkness in an unfamiliar wilderness location with the gigantic creature standing only steps away was not likely on anyone's bucket list of desired experiences during a lifetime. After a few moments of stillness, the creature began emitting an extremely low growl that, while not loud in volume, at first carried the primordial power of the largest imaginable feline predator, giant ursid, or dinosaur. It was a sound no relatively defenseless human would ever want to hear. The creature's titanic growl then rose in pitch and ended with a devastating loud whoosh of breath and seemed angry that brought many in the group right to their knees. Several seemed to pass out and drop to the ground. It was clear that the end of earthly existence might be at hand for everyone in the group. They unfortunately had shown up in the wrong place at the wrong time and summoned the wrong forest dweller. The immense height and powerful bipedal gait of the creature made it clear to anyone still conscious that a Bigfoot was standing in their midst. The creature seemed to take a few loud steps toward the van and was still again. An unusual metallic squeaking sound then began, and, to their amazement, those remaining conscious in the tour group could make out the barely visible white van rocking from side to side. The squeaking sound was the vehicle's suspension being pushed to its limits by the strong creature. The rocking of the van became more extreme with every passing second, and then, with a boisterous, wordless, angry shout from the creature, the van tipped over on its side and slid off a small embankment into the brush. The creature had executed a passenger van pushover. The van rolled over a couple of times, noisily crashing through the brush, and came to a stop relatively quickly, upside down. Oh God, no, cried Ginny Chavez. Her husband and both of her children were essentially passed out on the ground next to her. The creature, 
apparently followed the van down the hill a bit to inspect his vehicle expulsion handiwork. Ranger Martin, fortunately still conscious and somewhat aware, took in the immediate aftermath of the stunning van toss development to initiate survival steps. He pulled out his cell phone and quickly dialed a number. After a few seconds of silence, Martin said, Pam, this is Martin in van one. We've had an emergency, an accident. Out, just beyond Petite, and right inside the Carson tree line. The van's out of commission. Can you please get out here with the other van right now? Martin asked desperately. Breathing hard and trying to maintain the conversation with the stationed ranger, Martin listened for a moment and replied, No, I don't think anyone's hurt, but uh, one of the big Carson creatures found us and we're in deep trouble. Martin didn't have time to ponder the impact of his statement on Ranger Pam over the phone. He just said, yeah, okay, we'll see you ASAP. Martin disconnected the call and bent over with his hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath. Are they coming? Asked an extremely anxious Norm. Still gathering himself, Martin said, yeah, she'll be here soon. I think she gets it. He looked around to the best of his abilities in the dark and asked generally, is everybody okay? The tour participants pushed forth a little more than weak pain groans in response to this question. Tall Fred said, A few are down and out, but not injured. At least I don't think. Ginny Chavez was on her knees on the ground, tending to her flattened family members one by one. Some began to stir. Now, however, the Sasquatch situation was changing again. From the opposite direction from where the creature had initially advanced, came additional weighty footfalls and branch snaps as something was coming through the woods toward the group. No one missed this new sonic clue. Is that the same one or is it another one? asked Lynn with growing horror. I don't know, said Dave, who hadn't spoken in some time, but we need to just stay here. At that moment, a large fist apparently pounded the side of the overturned van down the hill indicating that there must be two creatures in the immediate area now. Footsteps in the brush could be heard on both sides of the human group. They seemed to be moving, literally through the trees. I think they're circling us, Dave said to Martin under his breath. Low growling from two directions in the forest was clearly audible to the tour group. How long will it take for the darn van to get here? asked Norm, virtually at the end of his wits with dread. No one answered this question, although everyone wondered about the unspoken answer. After a few minutes of listening to the creatures moving from side to side in the trees, the tour group got punched with even more fear as the heavy footsteps and growls now began moving directly toward the human group from opposite directions. Oh my God, cried Lorelei, not for the first time tonight. They're right here, said Fred, displaying his first expression of true panic during the night. Hold on to me, cried Ginny Chavez quietly to her family. With everyone bodily jammed together within just a few square feet and the creatures approaching, a light became visible on the other side of the nearest rise in the road. The group could hear a whining engine. The headlight suddenly got much brighter and a large vehicle came bolting over the hill. The white van rapidly came upon the group. Suddenly visible in the headlights to the driver, Pam, was a nine-foot-tall black creature standing a few feet in front of a huddled mass of much smaller humans. The creature's body was facing the people, but it had turned its upper body to observe the suddenly approaching vehicle. Duly stunned at the sight, Pam stomped on the brakes with all her might and the van skidded crazily. The large creature stepped gracefully to the side, let the van pass, and strode quickly up the hill into the near darkness. The van stopped about 10 feet in front of the again dumbfounded group of people. Before the van had even come to a complete stop, everyone had run straight for it and began grabbing for the door handle. They piled into the vehicle in a rampart, helter-skelter fashion. Do we have everyone? Martin soon asked very loudly. The bedraggled, wilted humans quickly looked around the van. Yeah, I think everyone's here, surmised Fred. Okay, go, Pam, instructed Martin from the front passenger seat. Ranger Pam didn't wait to hear another word. She shifted into drive, floored the gas pedal, 
churned up some dirt and sped straight ahead along the forest road through the trees. I'll take the Gunnison cutoff back to the station, she yelled out over the rumble of the van's engine. In essence, this meant the van wouldn't need to turn around and go back through tonight's Bigfoot territory. Thanks for getting here so fast, said Dave to Pam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dave was on the floor of the second row seats right behind the driver. He hadn't managed to find a seat belt, so he had just flopped into whatever available crevice he could find. His head near the center cup holder, he said toward the front. We almost didn't make it. Good gracious, I saw that thing, said Pam to everyone. No one spoke for a few minutes. Uh, there were two things, clarified Martin. Oh, jeez, replied Pam. Meanwhile, as the van emerged from the trees and bumped loudly along the moonlit dirt road toward the station, most of the tour guests were lying back in exhaustion clinging to their loved ones and crying as they slowly realized they may well survive this night. In the second to last row of seats, Dottie had her head down and pressed firmly into Norman's chest, shaking and crying. Norm was busy taking long swigs out of his liquor flask from across the van aisle where Jane was hugging her. Lorely said dryly to Norm, Mister, I hope you got a lot in that bottle. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!